Listo. Good afternoon, friends. My name is Saifa Shouf, and I proudly serve as a senior fellow in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs and as vice president in the Office of Engagement at FIU. And today, I have the distinct honor of helping to facilitate an important conversation on trends and impacts of this global pandemic of COVID-19 uh, with respect to social, economic, and security policies in the Caribbean. And uh, I'm very excited, before I jump in, that we have a range of very accomplished scholars and speakers that are going to be sharing insight and perspective with us, uh, as well as giving us an opportunity for those of you that are out there on the Zoom chat on Facebook Live to ask questions. So starting off, I'm going to, I'm going to read through the bios of our speakers, and then uh, we're going to be hearing some presentations from them, and we're going to be hitting them with questions. So it's going to be live fire, and we're really excited. So first up on deck, we have uh, our uh, esteemed colleague uh, from FIU, Dr. Eileen Marty. Dr. Marty is a physician with more than 40 years of clinical research uh, and work in the fields of infectious disease, public health, mass gatherings, disaster response, and medical countermeasures for weapons of mass destruction. Dr. Marty served in the United States Navy for 25 years and has served the United Nations both as a member of the UN Monitoring, Verification, and Inspection Commission, and for the WHO and Mass Gathering Events and Health Security Interface. She currently serves on the President's Advisory Council Combating Antibiotic Resistance Bacteria and on the board of the International Federation of Tropical Medicine. She is also the co-editor for Elsevier's One Health Journey Journal. Dr. Marty, welcome. Um, next up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Joy St. John. Dr. John is, is, St. John is dedicated and reliable with the track record of achievements in public health systems management and the development of health diplomacy. Her firm but fair style has assured her a place in networks of practice across the world. Uh, serving in the capacity as executive director of CARPHA from July 2019, the executive director provides leadership and direction to CARPA in ex executing the functions laid out in an intergovernmental agreement. Previously served as an assistant director general of the WHO from October 2017 to 2019, with direct responsibility for the WHO's Climate and Determinants of Health initiatives, and first Beijing to be Assistant Director General. I'm from the CARICOM nation, so shout out for that. That's a big deal. Former Chief Medical Officer of Barbados, first Beijing to hold that office for over 12 years, top public health advisor to the Minister of Health, and responsible for oversight of the management of the health sector, and has served as chairperson of the executive board of the World Health Organization, first Caribbean person to do so from 2012 to 2013. Also joining us uh, in a bit um, on, the, on our chat, one of our panelists is, uh, is FIU's very own Dr. Eduardo Gamarra. Dr. Gamarra is a fully tenured professor of political science in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at our FIU. He's been at FIU since 1986, where he also directed the Latin American and Caribbean Center from 1994 to 2007. As a director of LAC, Dr. Gamara was involved in research and public policy issues, academic exchanges, fundraising, and multiple activities in most of LATAM and Caribbean. In February 2016, he was appointed founding director of the Latino Public Opinion Forum at the Stephen J. Green School of International Public Affairs. Dr. Gamara obtained his PhD in political science from the University of Pittsburgh in 1987. He had the for good fortune of being, uh, being able to acquire that under the mentorship of Dr. James Malloy, one of the leading experts on the, uh, Bolivia and the Andes. Throughout Dr. Gamara's career, his research, teaching, and consulting focus has been on countries of Lat Latam and the Caribbean. He's conducted research and served as a consultant in a range of countries throughout the regions uh, uh, including but not limited to Argentina, Honduras, Peru, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Bolivia, Haiti, and Trinidad. The focus of his work includes security, democratization, drug trafficking, and related illicit industries, political parties, campaigns, elections, public opinion, and among other topics. So today, uh, we're very fortunate that we've got this range of scholars, uh, and to launch us right into this important conversation, we've got our very own Dr. Eileen Marty, 
who's going to be giving us a presentation on impacts on the Caribbean uh, that are uh, springing forth uh, in this in this COVID-19 era. Dr. Marty. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, can you see my slides? We can. I can see them. Okay, excellent. All right. So let's let's get on with it because there's a lot to cover. So. What happened here? Well, we have a perfect storm of problems that are particularly pertinent in the Caribbean. I'll explain why momentarily. So this is a disease that involves the economy. Global trade and commerce is very much impacted. Global tourism, hospitality industry, very important, very Im impacted. Mass gatherings have perpetuated it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's impacted by and impacts climate change. Uh, it's impacting a immunologically naive population, meaning that no one on earth, uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, had had this disease before. Uh, it's a very bizarre and adaptable virus. It's an RNA virus with a significant mutation rate and the ability to recombine within cells. It is immunogenic, but in a very strange way. It also has a horrible feature called antibody-mediated enhancement that makes it very tricky to find a good vaccine and trickier to find some of the types of drugs that we've been developing recently that are antibody drugs. And it might, there's some data, it might be hiding in immunologic privileged sites in some individuals. It's a spillover event because it came into us from, uh, it does not have a, uh, any impact with vectors as far as we know, but it was a spillover event from the animal kingdom. There is a reservoir host that needs to be identified. We'll talk about bats and other animals in a minute. Uh, it is not a species selective virus, which is, makes it very dangerous. And of course, these social determinants of health, such as poverty, uh, how laws impact on things, infrastructure and so forth, which are very pertinent to what's going on in the Caribbean. And so all of this makes us a one health disease. What's going on in the Caribbean? Well, we've got uh, healthcare systems that are generally overburdened and underfunded, which is going to make it difficult to get the testing done that's absolutely critical to get this thing under control. Um, there's, it's going to disrupt what healthcare system you have, not to mention like all the rest of the nations, it's going to obviously, uh, it's already impacting on education, the economy. Many Caribbean nations are low to middle income nations, which have a higher challenge because of this. Um, Caribbean nations in general have close human interactions in how they culturally interact with one another. And that's usually a really wonderful thing, but not necessarily for this disease. And it's common in the cultures to have multi-generational families uh, with grandparents uh, taking care of grandchildren frequently, which of course for this disease is problematic. Um, and of course, many are island nations, which magnifies the supply chain issue that everyone is having, not to mention some nations have political complications. And we can see in the chart here, and this is from a few days ago, the rising number of cases without the rising uh, amounts of testing that need to be done to bring this thing under control. So this thing went from an outbreak to a pandemic in a short period of time. What is it and how did that happen? Uh, first, let's understand what is a pandemic. Remember the virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS-CoV-2 and I'll explain why momentarily. So uh, an outbreak is an illness, new or old, that happens in unexpectedly high numbers. And then an epidemic is sort of a big outbreak, right? But it, it, and it's spreading more quickly to more people than a normal outbreak would be. A pandemic is then uh, a, an epidemic, if you will, or an outbreak that spreads across countries and across nations. So if you follow the standard definitions, this became a pandemic in early February. Uh, but it wasn't called that, and it wasn't called that for a, a variety of reasons, and let's look at why. One of the reasons is that's not the responsibility of the World Health Organization. World Health Organization operates under, uh, for pandemics, under the international health regulations of 2005 that every single member state signed, including all your countries. Um, and so their, their role is to determine if that there is an outbreak and then determine if it is a public health emergency of international concern. 
And although it can be debated whether they should have done that a week before they did or a week or the actual day in which they did, which is 30th of January, they met that obligation on the 30th of January. Um, and to call something a pandemic, as I say, is outside the scope of the wording of the World Health Organization, but they decided to do that in March because way too many leaders in way too many countries were not giving this disease the seriousness, the enormous seriousness that this disease deserves. So what is this virus? Well, it comes from a huge order called midoviralis and all those viruses, nido from the, the Latin word that means nest because of the way the genetic information is nested in the sequence of RNA that these viruses have. So they're all nested viruses. Only this one group over here is ever found in any kind of insect or other arthropod, but that's not at all in the subfamily of coronaviruses, all right? Uh, and in that family, we have four genuses, alpha, beta, delta, gamma. The only ones that have impacted humans are alpha and beta. If you look at the alpha and beta groups, you have uh, some coronaviruses here that cause common cold in humans. In the beta, we have several viruses, four different, vi five different viruses really. We have the, um, some that are basically respiratory viruses here. They can be severe in some individuals. We have MERS and then we have SARS. And if you look at the SARS, that's in a subgenus, Every single member of the SARS coronaviruses, they're in the same species. There are just differences of subspecies. That's what we're talking about. So SARS-1 and SARS-2 are members of the same species, but they differ the way, say, uh, a St. Bernard might differ from a German Shepherd. They are both dogs but they're not exactly the same. And they have some significant differences in how they impact us, but they're all beta coronaviruses, okay? Now, where'd they come from? Well, the best data going back and analyzing and cross-checking the genetic material of many, many coronaviruses that are known, it's most closely related to viruses and bats have thousands of these coronaviruses. They live with them, bats immune system lets them live with them very happily and very, Fine, but this bat called the horseshoe bat had the closest related member found. And in fact, one particular specimen called the rat G13 specimen, which was found in a little cave in Yunnan, China, back in 2013 is 97% or almost 97% identical to the SARS virus of COVID-19. And uh, you can see there are the SARS virus here that caused COVID-19. And here you can see that it is very, very close related to this uh, Rhinophilus affinis. And it's pretty far away from MERS, the one that caused such a big problem in, uh, in, the, in um, Saudi Arabia and more recently in Korea. South Korea, in fact, has handled this outbreak better than virtually every other country because they were impacted by MERS, by this virus, this close relative cousin, if you will, uh, of SARS back in 2015. And so they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna go through that again. Dr. Marty, Dr. Marty, question for you on that. Um, uh, because there's been a lot of conversation about South Korea's response to COVID-19. Is that a function also of their enhanced testing capability? Uh, what it are is. the- Yeah, but th that's a whole story. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that story at the end. Let me go through sure. these real quick. Keep going, I, keep going, keep going. Yeah, okay. So here's the Yunnan where, where that particular individual specimen was found. It's a thousand miles away from uh, Wuhan, which is right under the U here in Hubei province, very far away. Um, even though there was a lot of work with other rhinophilus affinities in Hubei that came mostly from this area here near Shanghai, uh, this is actually the closest specimen and it's not even from that area, okay? I told you that this, is, this is, has affinity to other animals. This is a huge problem. The spike protein of coronaviruses uh, fits into, the, let's call that the lock, fits into a lock 
uh, a lock and key. So this would be the key and the lock is the ACE2 receptor of humans. It fits beautifully into, into the human ones. It turns out that the ACE2 receptor or the lock for cats, ferrets, macaques, and chimps is almost identical, if not identical to that of humans. And we've already seen disease in domestic cats of patients with COVID-19 and the big story, uh, the uh, tigers and lions in the zoo. Uh, make no mistake, COVID-19 is a One Health disease, and it got um, it got to be really big in the world uh, as of March 16th, when the world overtook China in the number of cases. And this is continuing, and it will continue until the rest of us can get our curves flattened. So where are we now? It's the 21st of April. We're at we went from 168,000 cases on in March uh, 16th to almost. 2.5 million cases today with 171,718 deaths. And if you look at what's happening with the death rates in Europe right now, the case fatality rate is about 10.51 as of today. And in the US, I've seen it go up every single day. We're now at 5.37, even though we're testing more than before. Okay, so be very sure this thing is not getting better yet. Okay. And if you look at data from PAHO from today, you can see that uh, most of the confirmed cases so far, and it's only because of testing really that we can tell this, uh, are so far are coming out of data from uh, North America. But that's not uh, going to stay that way. It's going to change, and it's going to change fast. And if we focus in on the Caribbean, we can see that most of the imported cases to the Americas came, to the rest of the Americas came either from Spain or the US, Italy or France, United Kingdom. Look how far down China is as a source of this virus to the Americas. And the deaths I'm telling you are way underestimated. Uh, there was an article today in the New York Times that talked about a little of it, but I'm gonna tell you why. Part of it is leadership it, it issues. Leaders not understanding that if you don't get a handle on where and when and how people are infected, then you're acting blind and the thing is actually gonna get worse. So we have an underestimation because of leadership issues coupled with lack of funds. So you have under testing and under reporting. You have people being turned away even today in hospitals in the US. So I suspect it's at your places too, where people have all the signs and symptoms but they're not sick enough to be hospitalized, so they're sent away without testing. Um, there's people who are dying and not being tested. So under testing and under reporting. The baseline is off because we're sheltering in place. The numbers of traffic and violent deaths are down. So when you compare, in these cases, England, Spain, France, Netherlands, uh, and so forth, you see the, that the number of deaths in 2020 is much higher than expected. But this baseline is actually off. So when you look at the New York Times article that's saying, for example, there are uh, 7,300 more deaths in Spain than reported from COVID-19, that baseline is off. It's actually higher than that. And that's true for all the other countries as well. And also, there will be more deaths indirectly from COVID-19 because of lack of access to healthcare because of the overwhelming of hospitals from COVID-19. So that's where we are. What is it about this virus that's so darn awful? One thing is we know, again, remember, SARS-1 and SARS-2 are the same species. They're just variations on theme. SARS-1 and SARS-2 both have a tremendous ability to stay alive on surfaces, much more so for SARS-1 though. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, for SARS-2, uh, uh, the current problem. And if you look at the details, we can see that it can last in aerosolized forms for a prolonged period of time. There was an MIT study showing that if somebody coughs, that cough of aerosolized cloud of virus can go as far as 27 feet. 
And that's why the PPE, the stringent PPE for healthcare workers is so important. Uh, it can last seven days in respiratory secretions because our secretions have stabilizers that help the virus survive. What are those stabilizers? Mucus, sugar, salts that are in our saliva, that are in the diarrhea fluid. In urine and in feces, it can last for four days alive. And I'm talking about culturing out the virus and showing it's alive, not just looking for RT-PCR. Um, it can last uh, two and a half days in, in some soils and water uh, and, and uh, as many as nine days in suspensions. So uh, cardboard is an issue as well as a, a place that's shown that it can last for prolonged periods of time. Another big difference between SARS-1 and SARS-2 is that the infectious dose is less. So when we talk about infectious dose, we mean that number of particles of virus, in this case it's a virus, that have to get into somebody in order for that person to be sick from it, right? And we talk about an infectious dose 10, that would be that small amount that if you have a population, 10% with that small amount would show symptoms. Uh, an infectious dose 50 is a slightly larger amount that 50% of people exposed to that would show symptoms and, a, and an LD 100 infectious dose 100, ID 100, would be something that everybody would get sick from. So the infectious dose for SARS-2 compared to SARS-1 is 90 plaque forming units compared to 100 to 150 plaque forming units. That's one problem. Another problem is that the serial interval is less. The amount of time that it takes that virus to accumulate in your body so that you can share virus with somebody else averages about four days. That's a lot less than it was for SARS-1. The other thing is you accumulate a lot more. We're seeing a thousand fold more virus in the nasal passageways of people with SARS-2 than we ever saw with SARS-1. And of course the incubation period, the time between getting exposed and having symptoms is longer than the serial interval. So you invariably have people who are, um, who are um, shedding virus without having any symptoms. So in other words, pre-symptomatic spreaders, as well as people who don't ever have significant symptoms and don't even realize they were sick, but are still shedding enough virus to infect other people. So the rapid generation time, the high, the high viral load in the uh, oral cavity, and then later on in the lungs, uh, and this asymptomatic transmitters is why it's spreading so fast and why we've worked so hard to try and change the curb. Otherwise, the death rate that we would be seeing would be even more outrageous than what we're already seeing. And so, uh, so we've done things like closed schools, case isolation, but not, but in the, in the U.S., and I don't know what's going on right now in the Caribbean, please enlighten me. In the U.S., we're still not isolating people with mild and moderate from their household contacts. As long as we keep people in their homes with people who are negative, the people who are negative almost invariably end up testing positive. We need to isolate each case if we want to succeed the way South Korea has succeeded. Obviously, if someone's a child or incapable of taking care of themselves, then one other person does have to take care of that individual. But for, for those people who are not in that circumstance, we need to isolate each case, even the mild cases, even if they're not in hospitals. Um, testing is absolutely crucial to this. Uh, you're blind if you don't know who has it and who doesn't have it. Uh, Dr. Another Marty, you, uh, Dr. Marty, you raise a really uh, uh, great uh, point there, which is getting some insight as well as what's happening on the ground. Uh, I know that Dr. Joy St. John has also got uh, a presentation. So uh, I, I know that you've got a couple more slides on your, I wanna cut you short. I wanna make sure that we're getting a dynamic conversation going. Um, so if you'd like to keep going for a few more slides, a few more slides, please do so. All right, so wearing masks, even when you're not the person, when you're not necessarily trying to protect yourself, but to protect others is a way of decreasing the spread by asymptomatic uh, spreaders. Um, so we're trying to lower the case. The most important way of doing that is, again, as I said, you have to test every case, no matter how mild it is, 
or how severe, and you have to test every contact, every close contact, which means every household member of every case. Until we do that, we won't be where South Korea is because the reproductive number for this is very important. What, when, when the data first came out of China, the reproductive number for this virus was 3.9. In other words, very close to four. That means what? That's the number of people that each other person infects. And it has to do with how long a person who has it is infectious, how many days, it averages about 10 days for this virus. The opportunity for contact, which means the number of people you come in contact with, the transmission probability is, are those people infected and are they coughing or are they talking and sharing virus? And are you touching those contaminated surfaces and then touching your um, vulnerable uh, oral uh, mouth, nose, or eyes? And then how susceptible are you as an individual? And what we do to get this under control, and the way we got it under control for Ebola when we didn't have a vaccine and we didn't have an antiviral was by decreasing all these numbers as best we could. So you recognize the cases, and then you decrease the duration of infectious period if you can. You can't right now because we don't have a drug or vaccine, but we can decrease the opportunity for contact and the transmission probability by limiting mass gatherings, by hygiene, hand hygiene, body hygiene, room hygiene, and this contact tracing and testing. And this is why we keep t telling people that we have to have healthy living because if you're doing healthy living, you decrease your susceptibility probability. And when you do that, you can get that reproductive number below one. And when you do, you end the outbreak. You end the outbreak and you cannot stop these measures until you get the reproductive number below one. And you cannot know that the reproductive number is below one until and unless you do testing. And remember, stress is a huge factor because stress has a humongous impact. The reason I show a snake is that uh, you're asleep and there's a poisonous snake. Uh, what's the effect? The snake's asleep, you're asleep, no effect. You wake up, you see the snake, bam, you're scared. And that changes you psychologically. And th that psychological change has physiological changes that really impact on your ability to handle anything. Um, and that's true whether or not that's a real snake or a plastic snake, because your reaction is psychological and it changes your, your fight and flight reaction, your, uh, your hormones, your um, epinephrine and uh, cortisols, et cetera. All of those are impacted and they impact the microbe as well. So lowering the stress is a good thing. Presentation, we know mild. Uh, it is about 40%. Pneumonia is another 40%. Those are people who don't need to be hospitalized Then the severe and critical. Anybody can end up dead, however, because anyone can go downhill, but the probability obviously is higher if you present as a critical case. This is the way people have presented. In the U.S., we're seeing that the, the children have much lower incidence of fever. Only 56% of the children with COVID-19 have fever. But if you combine the three key symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath, then you see that in 93% of adults and 73% of children. All right, um, you want me to speed up. There are a lot of different PCR tests available. There's also now a lot of talk about antibody tests. What's an antibody test? Well, uh, this is a well down under here, and here you have little bits of COVID uh, for a human antibody to get on that you squirt on it. You, you soak it in the human antibody. You clean that off and, and pull off any antibody that's not sticking to it. And then you have a marker antibody that's an anti-human antibody, and if it lights up, it's positive. So the way the test shows up is the control should always be red. If you have IgG, which is the second antibody that's formed, uh, then you'll have that. That's supposed to be somebody who's seen this virus a, a while ago and has possibly recovered. If you just have the IgM, that's supposed to be somebody who's recently, more recently infected. And if you have both, you're somewhere in between. Now, the problem with these tests is that we're not sure what they're sticking to. Is it something unique to COVID or is it something that's found in other coronaviruses? Different tests are having different results. Who validated the test? What type of antibody did they use? Uh, what test subjects did they validate it with? Uh, are, they, are they screening just healthy people, random people? All these things are making this a big question mark right now, but ultimately a great solution and possibly a great solution 
for the Caribbean if you find the one that's really doing its job, because these things give you answers very quickly. Right now, when we screen patients, there's a, a number of diagnostic tests we do right away. And we're finding, of course, one of the most prominent things to look at is their lymphopenia, their loss of the certain kind of white blood cells, and the rising up of certain factors that indicate that a cytokine storm may be happening, which is the worst thing that can happen with these viruses. Uh, on their x-rays, they have very characteristic kinds of patchy infiltrates. And on their CT scans, we see this kind of honeycombing that is kind of a, we call it a ground glass opacities that can be very severe. So the lungs are highly infected. The heart is highly infected. The kidneys can be severely infected, as can the liver. And that's why people with cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, are, are very much impacted by this disease. So in closing, what are we learning? that the social and economic inequities are a big deal and they're a big deal in the Caribbean and this is much more dangerous than we thought. Leadership matters. That's why if we talk a little bit about what happened in South Korea, I'll, I'll give you some really good insights. Uh, rumors and panic continue to spread faster than the truth and that's a huge thing that's working against us. Climate change is affecting all of this and is being affected. If there's war and conflict in an, in an area, it's gonna complicate this that much further. We have already supply issues that only makes it worse. Psychological factors are a huge issue. Um, the, the, the way the profit-driven industries are with our drugs, our vaccines, and our diagnostics are making it unnecessarily complicated. Check your regulations because those regulations are part of the reasons that we've had problems in the United States and our world continues to be underprepared for these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And remember that health, these health problems are never just about health. They're also about culture and the economy and our general welfare as a species and always expect the unexpected. And with that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Marty. It was a, a, a extraordinary walkthrough of uh, the complexities of the challenge that we're, we're dealing with and, and COVID-19. Uh, we now uh, have an opportunity to hear, uh, uh, I believe that Dr. Joy St. John uh, has a presentation uh, she's gonna be sharing with us uh, before we jump into our conversation with uh, Dr. Marty and Dr. Joy St. John and Dr. Gamada. Uh, Dr. St. John, are you uh, ready to, there you go, great. So I hope you're seeing the screen. I'm trying to get onto screen show. Thanks for this opportunity. And Great. I'm going to be speaking about trends and impacts from the Caribbean perspective, um, looking at social, economic, and security policies. This is what I hope to finish within the 10 minutes. And I start with a quote from the Chair of Heads of Government of CARICOM, the Honorable Mia Motley. This battle requires not just a whole of government approach, but a whole of nation and a whole of region approach on the part of us within this Caribbean region. The world is fighting for every single resource that it can, and countries large and small are in the race together. And as the Chair of, of CARICOM, currently there has been a mandate for such a coordinated response. So what is CARFA's role? CARFA is the Caribbean Public Health Agency, formed just about seven years ago from the amalgamation of five regional health institutions. And so we are supporting the CARICOM region through the perspective of health security. And there is coordination of the public health response, provision of advice to non-health sectors, risk communication, and of course, resource mobilization. So we actually started working on this in early January. We alerted the chief medical officers of the region. And this is a schematic which shows the kind of support we have been given in terms of technical advice, guidance, before the cases started and since. CARFA has not acted alone, however. Oh, this, these are some of our products. 
We produce um, situation reports every other week. And when it was at the stage of trying to prevent importations, uh, we were working very much on our border control. We produce guidelines for the cruise sector. And of course, there's always been technical advice, not only to, to governments at the national level, but also at the regional level. So we have not been doing this alone. CARFA is part of the security cluster of the CARICOM community. And you will see that from November, but we were thinking of measles at the time, the security cluster had raised epidemics to tier three of the four tier risk and threats table. And in January, we started coordinating with Sedema and we also started tracking persons coming from areas of concern to the Caribbean. And that continued until we started to have our own cases. The regional security system has been supporting us first on, an, on a sporadic basis with the transporting of urgent samples, but now that there have been um, border closures, they, we have actual scheduled runs, mainly three days a week, but sometimes on weekends as well. And we have been detailing our security sectors, letting them get to know what COVID means and how they can protect themselves. So we spoke first with immigration, immigration and customs chiefs, then with prisons chiefs, because we knew that there was an issue um, or there could be a potential issue. And so we wanted to have a regional response to this whole um, issue of dealing with the prisons. Um, and then we had a, an interface first through the regional security system with the, um, the commissioners of police and the, the chief, chiefs of staff of the defense forces or army. And then we actually presented to the ministers with responsibility for national security. So all along the, long, the way we've been reaching out, but very much within the context of health security. So this whole issue of governance of this response the CARICOM community has various organs. Um, CARFA has been getting political guidance from the Council for Human and Social Development, the Ministers of Health of the region, and the heads of government have convened three meetings where we were entertained. First, at an intercessional heads where we presented this as a topic on an agenda, and then two specific meetings to address COVID-19, the last being um, last week. And it is there that regional solidarity was signaled by the heads of government in terms of interregional travel protocols, because I told you at this time, we have quite a few border closures, um, joint procurement of medication supplies and equipment, and this whole issue at looking at a regional response to food security. Now there was an issue of the cases and the region of CARICOM did not um, get cases until just a day or so before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. And for most of us, most of our countries are straddling between the importation phase and the declaration of either local transmission or community or nationwide transmission. Except for one of us, the measures that we have implemented, the suppression measures to try to, to control the outbreaks um, have been blunting the curve and slowing down the pace at which illness and hospitalization um, presents itself to our systems. And most of the countries are operating um, separate facilities for COVID-19. So the usual health response, the usual um, both prevention and, and treatment and curative 
um, parts of the health systems can continue. So you will see um, a PAHO listing and most countries are declaring sporadic cases, clusters or cases of cases, and one or two are declaring community transmission. There's also the issue of testing, and I heard the previous speaker refer to this. I want you to look closely at this graph. It shows the coverage of testing, and on the left are countries, and on the right are <clears throat> some key global figures. And you're going to see something. In terms of the test per million population, our numbers are not bad, but some of that is a function of the fact that we're very small populations, as you would expect. But there has been a concerted effort to test not just along the lines of the overall case definition as defined by WHO and also the, the Caribbean case definition as defined by my organization, CARFA. But there has also been an attempt to try to do um, identification of cases and contact tracing so that the ways in which testing has been conducted is very much along the directed lines of uh, contact tracing. So there have been circles of contacts tested. Um, we are still focusing more on the symptomatic. We've moved away from a connection to travel or links to someone who's traveled. And so we have also been testing uh, severe acute respiratory infections found in the hospital setting. And CARFA and PAHO have also encouraged countries to keep up their normal surveillance and their surveillance in sentinel sites and the hot spots, like, like the prisons, like the nursing homes. Or um, like in the case of one country, there has been an outbreak in a call center, um, which has turned into a hotspot. So the surveillance has allowed us to try to target where we need to go with our testing because we are very much affected by um, the global um, supply chain issues. You will see here also our average turnaround time. Once the samples get to CARFA from around the Caribbean and we're testing 18 of the 26 member states, the others have their own testing capacity. And once they get to CARFA, the turnaround time is 33 hours. Uh, we had pledged between 24 and 48 hours and we're continuing. And you see the kinds of, of testing um, that we have been doing. The other thing that we have been watching, because we know that the majority of cases are going to be uh, mild or not detectable, we've also been watching the deaths, but we have, for the most part, in the CARICOM space, because remember, the CARICOM space is not the entire Caribbean, so the, the, the French territories, uh, only one of the Dutch-speaking a couple of the of the UK overseas territories, um, the death accumulation has been modest up to this point. So, what is the effect of some of these suppression measures on the sociocultural life in the Caribbean? The previous speaker did go into detail about how we operate. We are one people. We like to. Um, we like to have fun. We like to have family gatherings. It's all tied up with food. And so there was resistance at first to this whole issue of what we call in the Caribbean, the lockdown. And most of us have learned how to be compliant with what was first called social distancing, but now is called physical distancing. Most of the countries have given some guidance about the use of masks by non-health persons. We're um, speaking about cloth masks here, but this is part of our culture. Here we are lining up, because what has happened is that we've had closures of, of the places we can avoid. The, 
the beaches, the bars, the um, mass gatherings, sports, sporting activities have been canceled. We do church by distance. Um, we just had to cancel some of our carnivals, Barbados's crop over. And then there were the targeted measures, which were governmental overlays, part of the lockdown to try to keep a control of the spread of the disease because we were aware that in children, they may not have illness, but they may shed quite a bit because of the viral load in the upper respiratory tract, the closures of schools, um, for the places that we cannot avoid, the supermarkets, the pharmacies, there are measures for staggered, and this is why you see people lining up. They have a time in some countries by your surname, your alphabet, and a day, and you have a specific time to go in and get your, your food and, and your out. So that this whole issue of people ganging up together, it's being controlled. The response is much better, but a lot of us are um, suffering from BSA, beach separation anxiety. Uh, so what have been the economic impacts of the suppression measures? And you see here that they have been, oh, sorry, let me go to the previous slide. They have been um, pervasive. A lot of our economies are already um, subject to the fact that we have a lovely address for having fun, but one of the worst addresses for um, severe weather events. And, and we have countries that have had multiple impacts over the years affecting um, the economies. Dr. Mike Ryan of WHO says countries have to force the disease outbreak to end. And so the suppression measures which the CARICOM governments implemented almost all at the same time have definitely slowed disease transmission. But that has also been accompanied by a slowing of tourism sector. And this is one of the most tourism dependent sectors um, in the world, in the Caribbean. So we saw a slowing of activity in the season, which traditionally ends this month with border closures from outside. So countries locked down and our sending countries like US, parts of Europe, UK, they stop, send, they stop sending tourists. The service industries have also seen contractions because of the physical distancing that I described. Cultural industries have been affected, sports. So cash flow difficulties and layoffs have started occurring in both the public and private sectors. And as a result, the governments that could have, have applied stimulus packages, modest though they are, and social safety nets are being um, put in place for vulnerable groups, both by the government and by volunteers, but by no means is it a perfect situation. So in conclusion, um, you see that the Caribbean has had a coordinated response, but it makes sense. We have the frameworks, we have the political um, um, infrastructure, and we all more or less got our first cases all at the same time. And we've had the opportunity of seeing what others have done and what has worked. The public health response has been implemented through the, the health security perspective. Uh, we also have a regional coordination mechanism for health security, which helped guide technically um, some of the measures that were put in place. The CARICOM heads of governments have implemented measures and have also call for a coordinated approach, which we, are, which we are doing. Social gatherings have affected how we operate and integrate, and, but, can, but more and large, uh, more people understand that this is life or death and they're doing what they have to because we do not have deeply resourced um, health sectors. So we understand that we, we need to really behave if we are to curtail illness. Um, this has affected tourism and other um, money earners and money earning sectors in our region. 
and we do have supports, but our financial situation is really not the best. And we, um, we are trying our best to see how we can, as, some, as one of the heads of government said last week, we have to learn to live with COVID. How are we going to do this? And how are we going to both save lives and um, bolster the economy until the world can decide how money will flow at this diff difficult time? So I end by saying, look at the top left. It's, it's a bird saying curfew. I didn't know about any curfew, but it's one of the things that the Caribbean people have given up more or less. And that is the joy of the beach, the joy of the exercise and the mental health um, support that it was for a lot of us. So on that note, um, I hope I haven't overstayed my welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. St. John. Um, that was a very comprehensive uh, 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 walkthrough of a range of the challenges specific to uh, CARICOM countries and response preparedness. So um, at this point in time, I believe that we have Dr. Eduardo Gamara uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, Dr. Gamara, uh, I, I, I understand that you might also have a, a presentation. Um, I might ask of you, Dr. Gamara, several of the folks that are on the chat um, presentation with us today have asked if our entire conversation is only in English today. So feel comfortable where, uh, where appropriate in your presentation uh, to also pivot to some of your remarks being in Spanish. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do have a presentation, but clearly nothing as elaborate as my two uh, previous colleagues. And uh, so I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to, to, to share it with you. Uh, so uh, what, I, what I will do is, uh, is begin by uh, uh, by uh, really making some very broad remarks about uh, about the Caribbean, um, and uh, I want to uh, um, uh, to emphasize that you know most of my work in the Caribbean has been on Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I also want to emphasize that I'm a political scientist and and I'm uh, largely by trade. Uh, somebody who's done a lot of public opinion research in those, in those two countries. So um, I, I don't wanna sound like some of our leaders, both in the region and here in Washington, um, uh, speaking about uh, issues uh, related to science and, uh, and particularly this, this specific issue. Uh, uh, I have uh, no training whatsoever in, uh, in COVID-19. Uh, but I do uh, think I know a little bit about what is going on both in terms of the political impact and uh, and the economic impact on, on the region. So so my remarks are going to be in that uh, in that direction. Um, para los que quieren que les hable un poquito en español, pues eh, lo que les lo que les puedo decir eh, simplemente a, a modo introductorio es que soy politólogo. Mi trabajo se enfoca sobre todo en, el, en eh, República Dominicana y en Haití. Eh, no soy experto, obviamente, en este tema científico, médico tan complejo, eh, pero sí sé algo sobre eh, lo que sucede políticamente en esos, en esos países. De manera que mis comentarios van a, por una parte, enfocarse en la parte eh, más, eh, digamos, del impacto económico y también voy a hablar un poco sobre lo que está sucediendo en términos políticos en la región. Ok. So, um, just a couple of... Um, uh, of introductory comments. You know, one of the things that we do know about the Caribbean, and this is really something that's always been striking to me, especially because, you know, I started working there in the, in the early 80s, and, uh, and then my, my work intensified in the 90s and in the, in the 2000s. Um, and so um, as uh, uh, somebody who worked closely with governments there, I was always amazed by, you know, this is a large region, right? 20 million alone in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. But I was always amazed by the preparedness and the resiliency of, of, the, of the Caribbean islands, uh, especially in terms of one might say, you know, they're, they're, uh, they, they are accustomed to hurricanes, to natural events of all sorts, and most, most recently, as we know, including earthquakes. Um, 
just in this 20, 21st century, for example, the region has had to deal with uh, cholera, uh, the N1, H1 uh, um, flu, uh, dengue, and most recently chikungunya. And I accompanied uh, the governments in the Dominican Republic specifically in looking at how they responded to those to those specific uh, 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 diseases. So, um, um, but the reality is, as our previous speakers have addressed, uh, the current issue is of much graver magnitude. It's something, of course, that not only the Caribbean but the rest of us have never have never faced, and and it's occurring in uh, in the Caribbean when many of the islands have yet to recover from the earthquakes in the case of Puerto Rico, right? But also Haiti, but also they haven't recovered yet from the two uh, hurricanes in 2017. So we're dealing really with a starting point which is already quite weak. And, and so when you think about it in terms of what governments are doing, I think it's, it's important to understand the impact. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, the Economic Commission for Latin America came up with a, a very good report, uh, basically outlining five ways in which uh, COVID-19 will affect the region as a whole. And I'm extrapolating from that and looking specifically at the impact on, uh, on, on the Caribbean. First and foremost, we know that the Caribbean is facing an incredible drop in economic activity, right? Primarily because of, because of its of the drop in its in its relations and its trade relations with uh, uh, throughout the region, uh, the Dominican Republic is one of the largest trading partners of Florida, for example. Most of that trade has come to a standstill, right? So we're talking about enormous drops in volume. We're talking about enormous drops in value, and most importantly, as well, we're talking talking about a dramatic impact on price. Now. Now, we don't really know what the impact is going to be, and, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, we'll see that only once this is over and these, and these countries are, are facing recovery. The other thing we know is that the price of primary products has dropped dramatically in the region. We know what the impact has been of the drop of minerals, the drop in, in oil, of course, most recently, and how that can impact oil producing countries. This might actually be the only good news in this context with the, with the drop in oil prices. Those of you who know, for example, what the cost of a normal uh, days, uh, what, uh, what, a, what a gallon of gasoline costs in, in a place like, like the Dominican Republic or Haiti, know that you know, this might be good news, but it's, it's good news in, the, in, the, in a context in which everything else has collapsed, even demand for, for oil in the Dominican Republic. So Dr. Gamara, yeah. that might not be good. That might not be good news for my uh, for my my people back in Guyana that were counting on oil. But you are that, correct. That's correct. Sorry. That's exactly correct. Although remember, you have to understand these are futures markets. Correct. Um, correct. Well, the price of oil dropped, you know, yesterday to below zero. I think it was thirty five, negative thirty five. You know, June that those prices will recover. Uh, probably not to where they were, but they that they will. Correct. Recover. So, right. so uh, uh, it's still good to be an oil producing country, especially if you know how to manage it. But that's another discussion altogether. Different discussion, thank you. All right, so, so the third thing, of course, uh, for the Caribbean in particular, and for the Dominican Republic, for even for, for countries like Cuba and so on, is the interruption of remittances to the region, right? We now know from some very good sources that uh, remittances from the United States abroad have declined dramatically as people have lost jobs here and cannot send uh, remittances back home. In the case of the Caribbean, especially again, thinking about it from the perspective of the Dominican Republic, not only was it receiving remittances from the United States, but also from places like Spain, and therefore that collapse is also having a significant impact on, on the Dominican Republic. But probably the most important area, and the previous speaker also alluded to this, is the, lo the lower demand for tourism services. If not, I think it's probably correct to say, you know, the complete collapse of the tourism services, right? That um, CEPAL projects a 25% contraction. It's, you know, um, I think that that might even be somewhat optimistic. If we take, for example, what the impact has been throughout the region, hotels are at zero occupancy. Right, all included, uh, all inclusive destinations are empty today. 
cruise lines have essentially disappeared. There are no flights from the US, Europe, or, or, or anywhere. Uh, flights between the islands have also disappeared. Internal tourism is also at a, at a at, you know, basically collapsed, right? Global shipping has, has come to a, to, a, to a standstill, so therefore, this has an impact on food, on medicine, and any other necessity linked to the tourism industry. And of course, there's a restricted access to food and healthcare and other supplies, which tourism very much needs. Tourism, especially what the, what, what the Caribbean has done in terms of positioning itself for tourism, is it has, it has been a very safe tourism, right? This isn't really adventure tourism in the way other parts of the Americas are. And so the kind of tourist that will not go now or won't get back on a cruise line is that tourist who is accustomed to, you know, five-star accommodations and, and all, you know, all of the kinds of services that came, that came with the kind of infrastructure that, that, the, that the Caribbeans developed. Let's take a look specifically at what the Dominican Republic has done. And, and this is, I think, to, to, to illustrate what many in the Caribbean have done, right, over the last 50 years. Exponential growth in tourism. Um, by 1984, tourism outpaced sugar. So today, the largest and most significant part of that industry is tourism, right? They, they found a, a very significant uh, um, gold deposit, and that's become very important, but that too is in crisis. Uh, in the last eight years, they've had over 40 million tourists. Uh, in, in 2018, 6.6 .6 million alone, right? The Dominican Republic generates about $45 billion in annual income from, from, uh, from tourism. And, and the huge tourism infrastructure, in fact, they were about to inaugurate a, a new, very, very fancy place uh, with an investment of about $450 million. The impact on jobs, 330,000 jobs have been have been affected and this in the context of a of an economy that really led the region right in in terms of economic growth but yet a region where if 65 percent of its economically active population is in the informal sector and that by the way as an observation for the entire region when you have over 50% of your population in the informal economy. In other words, people that live day to day, right? And when you basically shut down their possibility of making a living, right? This is a recipe for political chaos. It's a recipe for social unrest. And this is what we're beginning to see, not just in parts of the Dominican Republic, uh, but we're beginning to see it throughout the, throughout the hemisphere including, of course, as we know here in the United States, right? So what uh, the final observation, I think, is that, you know, we, we have um, in this context then of collapse, right, more than likely um, investors are going to be very, very, very slow in coming back, right? Uh, those economies are going to be, you know, the least attractive to, to, to reinvest in. And so, the, as Sepal points out, you know, there are many reasons to be very significantly worried about the possibility of the Caribbean making a quick comeback from this after COVID, right? If there is a COVID, uh, an after COVID, what shape that will take, you know, the, the previous speakers have, have, uh, have alluded to that. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's, uh, you, we're probably really talking about a horizon that ranges from the next uh, uh, year to 18 months, well down into the next decade, right? The impact of this is going to be so extraordinary on the region, right? Now, so let, let me just shift very quickly here so that we have time for, for, for uh, conversation with all of, the, all of the people that are attending this, uh, this, uh, this seminar, right? Um, the political impact of, of COVID on, on the Caribbean is really not th that different from the political impact that we're seeing elsewhere in the region, right? Democracies are in trouble all over the region, and, and they've been in trouble before COVID, right? Uh, they have been in trouble not just because there was an economic slowdown to begin with, right, but because of a very serious a uh, 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 um, number of issues that I, that I want to uh, address very quickly. Let me move forward and then I'll move backward. Um, for example, this taken from uh, the, the, this very significant work that 
Vanderbilt University and our own LAC does uh, uh, related to, to uh, public opinion in the region. Look, system support, in other words, support for democracy in the region is really at an all time low, right? I mean, this is really quite significant. And if you look at support for democracy in, in, uh, in the Dominican Republic, only 46%, right? That's very low. If you look at Jamaica, right? 49.8%. Uh, so, so we're talking about people, uh, you know, about areas where democracy, support for democracy has eroded significantly, right? And that comes in the context of, you know, problematic issues related to specifically the one characteristic of democracy, which is elections. In the Dominican Republic, there were elections, uh, uh, primaries that were held in October last year, very questionable accusations of fraud, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, failed attempt at, at holding municipal elections in February. Then the, then, you know, then the actual holding of elections um, in, uh, uh, a month later, right, already in, within the context of this, of this crisis. And now presidential elections, which were supposed to be held in in, uh, in May, which had been postponed until the month of July. So here you have a really significant political event that has been postponed, and which uh, you're having elections in the, con uh, pardon me, campaigns in the middle of this crisis. And of course, this leads to a very serious set of, of, of questions that, by the way, we're going through ourselves in the United States. Um, Presidents have constituencies. Now, although in neither the Dominican Republic or Haiti, for example, the presidents are trying to get themselves reelected, one of them tried and failed, but, uh, but the reality is that their party is facing reelection, right? And so presidents have constituencies. And to a certain extent, the, the COVID crisis has presented both a crisis and an opportunity for them because they are using. The, you know, the resources of the state, they are using the, uh, the ability to communicate, right, uh, uh, through, through the state uh, as a way to mobilize support for the, for the, uh, for the incumbent. Um, you know, and so this, is, this has become a problem, especially as the opposition sees itself essentially closed out from, from com competition. At the same time, there's some serious questions about, you know, what does the Constitution say uh, about something like this, right? And constitutions generally provide for states of exception. Well, the states of exception that we have throughout Latin America, you know, we're concerned here in Florida about, you know, being only able to go to, to, uh, to Winn-Dixie or Publix using our face masks and all of that kind of stuff, right? Look, in most of the region, executives have essentially imposed states of siege, whereby you can only go to the supermarket once a month. And if you go outside of your house, you are arrested for it, right? This has, of course, led to a whole series of accusations of executive um, abuses, of abuse of human rights, and so on, all in the name of ending the, the you know, of addressing the, the COVID-19 crisis. Now, my, my observation on that, of course, is that more than likely, you know, these situations are temporary and probably justifiable, right? Especially in, in the context of what Dr. Uh, Dr. Marty told us about, right? That, that how serious this is and how serious we ought to be taking it. And my, my, my uh, assumption is that once this is over, right? that, uh, that uh, democracies, liberal democracies, especially in the Caribbean and parliamentary democracies, will go back to being parliamentary democracies and, and, and liberal representative democracies as in the Dominican Republic. I'm a little bit more concerned about Haiti. But, uh, but if you look at other countries in the Caribbean or the circum-Caribbean, Venezuela, for example, has taken advantage of this situation, right? Used the crisis to actually crack down on the opposition and to essentially, you know, exert uh, more authoritarian control than it had previously. So these are the kinds of issues that are out there, and these are the kinds of issues that lead me to worry very much about the future of democracy in the, Car in the Caribbean and, and elsewhere. Uh, let me move very quickly to, to, to something else that, uh, that has to do also with, with a few things that the previous speakers addressed. 
right? This is satisfaction with democracy, right? Again, look at the very low levels of personal satisfaction with democracy. Look at the rate for the Dominican Republic and look at the others, right? Uh, so throughout the region, people are completely dissatisfied. And, uh, and this, is, this is very problematic, especially because it leads to the collapse of trust in leaders. People do not trust leaders in the region anymore. They don't trust them to resolve crises. They don't trust them to govern. And especially in the context of this, right, when you have such a decline in trust, I think, you know, there is reason to be absolutely concerned. And I should say here, I know perhaps I'm, I'm overstepping my bounds, but, you know, the most recent poll in the United States, um, uh, one that I did with Latinos and, and, and another one that came out just a couple of days ago, President Trump only has 36% trust right, by the average American. You know, this is not a good, a good figure for American democracy, and it's not a good figure for, for, for President Trump, and it isn't a good figure for uh, the rest of the region also, because especially in the context of a crisis, right, where most generally we always assume that we rally around our flag and we rally around the leader, right? Instead, what appears to be happening and this is why I worry about the region. Instead, what appears to be happening is that the crisis, rather than leading us to unite, it's leading us to increase polarization. And in a polarized political environment, reform is going to be very, very difficult. And so here, let me, let me just conclude very quickly by saying, you know, this essentially manifests itself in very weak institutions. I work on, the, you know, on political institutions. But one sector, and this Dr. Dr. Marty also uh, alluded to this at the very beginning, you know, it's really the, the saddest thing about the boom that Latin America had between 2006 and 2013. An incredible boom, a wasted historic opportunity, right? A, a commodity boom, the likes of which we are not likely to see again, certainly in my, in my lifetime, right? In which there was, billions of dollars floating about, especially from Venezuela, right? Which were not invested in the areas where they should have been invested, especially healthcare. As a result, what we have throughout the region is horrendous healthcare systems, incapable of, of, uh, of uh, responding to this, to this crisis, exactly as, as Dr. Marty said. So the reliance now, you know, so when you're asking the government to provide you with the resources to the, 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 the health, you know, uh, to address the healthcare crisis, right? It's virtually impossible without gobs of international assistance. And, and right now, the main international assistance that's coming in on the healthcare front is coming from China, right? So that's going to be a, a huge issue. And finally, let me say, you know, on this, it's the, the whole question of, of immigrants as well. You know, I, I talked about how, how immigrants uh, to the United States and Spain send back, uh, send back uh, remittances. But one of the real problems that, that uh, countries in the Caribbean are facing, especially countries like the Dominican Republic, is that not only do they expel immigrants, but they receive immigrants. And, uh, and the problem of relations with Haiti is going to grow increasingly complex as cases for, of COVID increase in Haiti, because they will, right? And the crisis in the Dominican Republic uh, becomes more, more, extense, more extensive. So um, with those uh, observations, I know they, they, they sound uh, terrible. And, uh, and um, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I think that, uh, um, the, the, the Caribbean has, uh, has an opportunity to, to overcome this with, uh, with better leadership and, and hopefully uh, with, uh, with a, a greater role, uh, a, more, a, a more proactive role uh, from the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gamara. That, um, I think that that added context that you provided about the economic and the political ramifications and just really the environment as a whole uh, in the Caribbean, really built upon the presentation from Dr. Marty, uh, as well as the presentation from Dr. Joy St. John. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump into some questions uh, for all, all of our panelists. I'm going to move around a little bit, and I'm going to ask our panelists to to keep their responses a little bit uh, a little bit shorter because 
I know that we're getting a lot of questions coming into us from uh, participants on the chat, and I want to encourage our panelists when I ask the questions, if you'd like to respond in Spanish or any other languages of the region, please feel free to do so. So really, the, the first question uh, I think I'll put to um, Dr. Uh, Joyce St. John and, and Dr. Gamada and then Dr. Marty, if you'd like to jump in. And so we know that tourism is a major uh, economic driver in the region and uh, much of the future of the region is linked to that. And uh, is, given this global pandemic, would it, uh, would it be safe to say that these nations in the Caribbean need to really rethink their long-term economic development strategies in light of what we're seeing with this global pandemic? So the, and, and, I, and I take the viewpoint of the previous speaker, but the governance of the Caribbean through the CARICOM community has been addressing this whole issue of the economic um, effects and the, the contraction of the tourism and other sectors head on and they have approached the funding agencies. So the rethinking has already started. The fact that there is a uniform um, approach in terms of the border closures and its effects on the economies is part of what drove the heads of government to request a public health protocol a protocol on travel and, and borders for the intra-CARICOM regional space. So this whole issue of rethinking the tourism is being done hand in hand with public health measures, which will allow for as much safety and preservation of life as possible. The long-term rethink, I think, is not just the Caribbean. I think there's a long-term rethink of other regions from the, the country perspective and also from the, the various sectors within the tourism sector. We have the cruise sector, we have aviation, we have conveyances be, because there are some landlocked countries in the CARICOM space. There has to be a total rethink and there has to be a commitment on the, on the part of some of the providers um, of sticking to protocols which were already agreed to. So we, we have to have a rethink to of the standards of operation, not just from the, the Caribbean perspective, but also from the perspective of the crews and the airline industries. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gamara, Dr. Marty, um, I'm going to go ahead and pivot from that response from Dr. Joyce St. John to really a question about funding priorities of public investment in health systems and the need to ensure adequate investments in public health, including prevention. Is it safe to say that arising from this pandemic, there's going to need to be both a national strategy and transnational rethink around funding priorities? Dr. Gamada, you touched upon it and sort of the commodities boom of 06 to 13. Uh, from where you stand, Dr. Marty, in the public health arena, um, are you seeing momentum or do, do you think that there's work that can be done uh, even from where we sit uh, to be able to impact favorably the change of um, investment and budget priorities? And Dr. Gamada, Dr. Gamada, please feel free to jump in. Okay, uh, this is Dr. Marty. Uh, hello. And um, yeah, well, you're asking more political questions and economic questions than actual public health questions. Right? Got it. You can, you can answer, you can answer, you know, we're all, we're all in our lane. So uh, I, I would say that the political and economic, if you want to they're uh, interrelated. They're absolutely interrelated. Okay. That's the bottom line, is okay. that health impacts on the economy and the economy impacts on the quality of health and the and, and health in general. So they're absolutely interrelated. And I think that if any if if there's any lesson from this, it's it's that. It's how interrelated these things really are when we have something as extreme as the situation as we have with COVID nineteen. So I would definitely take to heart uh, having 
always preparedness plans, surge plans, and memorandums of understanding between nations mm -hmm. that as uh, you know, Dr. Joy very beautifully spoke about what already is in place in the Caribbean. Um, I, um, I don't know if you remember, we've met a couple of times, Dr. Joy, in some of the conferences that Carlos has put together. So I'm, I'm very happy to be on a panel with you. Um, and uh, those kinds of things are absolutely invaluable where you actually share data, share resources, et cetera. It brings costs down for everyone. Uh, I know UNICEF and the World Health Organization is, uh, is very interested in, in providing help to the Caribbean as well. And I think the relationships that we have the, with these international bodies are extraordinarily important. And I'm horribly embarrassed by the actions of my government currently when it comes to the WHO because it's completely inappropriate, untimely, and, um, and unnecessary. Dr. Gamada? No, Dr. Dr. Joyce and John jump right in and then we're going to get our political scientists hitting us with some... Uh, I just wanted to say that in terms of investment in public health, there needs to be an uptick in the investment in prevention, primary health care and health system strengthening. And one of the things that the Caribbean has tried very hard to do is to give value for money. And that means more of an emphasis on primary health care, both public and private sector interventions. It's more um, cost effective. It gets you, the, the average person closer to the health system. And it also allows for prevention, both on the, on the individual um, patient level and on the population level. So we need to see, obviously, much more of that if we're going to be prepared for other such um, outbreaks. Uh, in terms of the global uh, public health structures, we need to have, as well, an improvement in, an, an, in the understanding of systems that are, are not well-resourced and a critical look at the subnational level for the, what was traditionally more well-resourced um, health systems, which had more of a rely, reliance on curative care. So there needs to be a better blend globally in prevention and curative care. Um, I appreciate that insight. And I think what you talked about with preventive care, I mean, I'm a, 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 a CARICOM person of origin from Guyana and I think about COVID-19, and I think about when I hear uh, scholars like Dr. Marty talk about underlying conditions, and I think about the prevalence of diabetes uh, in a place like Guyana, I'm not a subject matter expert, I can only speak anecdotally, and the implications therein of large population of folks or a high percentage of folks with diabetes, not, uh, sort of weaker systems around preventive uh, care and sort of case management of diabetes uh, and what that can actually mean as this pandemic uh, starts to really uh, get get uh, get in get more deeply into the woodwork. Dr. Gamada, political science take on funding priorities in the region and how governments. I mean, there's the old adage that budgets reflect values. Uh, what what are you, what's your take on that? Um, given the world that could become in resourcing uh, in public health uh, realities post COVID nineteen in in uh, Western Hemisphere. Again, uh, with my bias of looking at uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, right? And uh, um, I'm not talking about Cuba, and, uh, and I'm certainly uh, not of the CARICOM world as much as, as, uh, as you are, and, and I think Dr. Joy is. But, uh, but the real issue to me uh, has to do with what uh, the political outcome will be of elections uh, come July and uh, whether the, the whoever wins the elections has uh, the authority in Congress, you know, whether they can muster enough of a majority to be able to address the kinds of issues that were that were placed on the on the table now. Um, given the polarized nature of electorates, right, it becomes very difficult to think about consensus uh, leading to uh, addressing these very fundamental issues. And so uh, I think that, uh, you know, um, uh, the fact that uh, 
there's going to be a very, very severe economic contraction. Uh, the priorities that governments have are not going to be, unfortunately, Dr. Joy, they're probably not going to be in the area of, uh, of prevention. They're not going to be in the area, but they're going to be to addressing things that have to do to getting the, the, the economy back into shape in a very quick fashion to prevent the kind of turmoil that, uh, that uh, we're likely to face in the near future. And that really leads to, you know, uh, how quickly the tourism industry can be, can be jump, jump started. And for that, I think, you know, what Dr. Marty has told us is that it's going to take a long time. And uh, uh, because how do, you know, how do you deal with issues like, uh, um, you know, um, how many people can you put into an airplane? right, and ensure social distancing? How, what are cruises going to be like to ensure social distancing? What are hotels going to look like and restaurants and so on? And so all of that means essentially that, uh, you know, the, this is where the rethinking of the tourism industry, at least in the midterm, will have to take place. And then we'll have to see whether that is enough to jumpstart these economies. Now, Haiti, which has an enormous tourism potential, <laughs> You know, we've been dealing, uh, talking with uh, about this for at least the, the, the decades since the earthquake, right? Um, yeah, essentially, you know, has nothing to show for. Uh, it has, it had a few hotels that they've built, but uh, again, what is Haiti's development going to be like in this in this decade, right? It's once again uh, way at the back of the line and. Uh, and the government has absolutely no revenue to be able to deal with the current situation or any situation for that matter. Even though, as you all know, the cases of COVID in, in, in Haiti are very small right now. But Haiti has other issues. They need to have um, uh, congressional parliamentary elections very soon, right? And, uh, and they're already in a re-election campaign in a political system with all of those characteristics of lack of trust and so on in leadership. So. So I'm, uh, you know, uh, I, I hate to be so, so, uh, so pessimistic about, uh, about the future, but I think, you know, in at least for the midterm, right, things are going to be very, very difficult. But I think that the kinds of recommendations that came from Dr. Joy and certainly from Dr. Marty on the healthcare side, I hope that they have the, the influence there uh, uh, to be able to, you know, at least convince some of the ministers of health and presidents uh, about what the priority investments ought to be. You know, you oh, know so um, I, go ahead, sorry. Dr. Gamada, you, you raised a really good qu uh, point that I'm curious to hear uh, Dr. Joy St. John or Dr. Marty and also yourself. So Haiti's got a population, and, and this is a comment that came in through the chat. Haiti's got a population of 10 million people, but it's only reporting 44 cases. Can we assume that these are real numbers? Well, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, just, just let me say something. Okay, Dr. Joy St. John and then Dr. Marty. Yeah. This is what we want. We wanted a robust conversation, so let's get uh, let's get some varying perspectives of our of our panelists. So, I'm going to Dr. Try, Joy St. John and then Dr. Marty. I'm going to try to be diplomatic instead of robust. <laughs> the, um, the, <laughs> the lack of the lack of belief that the Caribbean can do some rethinking and, and have some emphasis on public health is one that, that he can retain as he watches what the heads of government allow coming out of their decision last week on having a coordinated public health response to COVID-19 with an emphasis on resilience and health system strengthening. So he can watch and see if we're telling the truth or not. Haiti is one of the countries that has got the first tranche of money from a, a well-known international development partner. Um, I would not say which one, but Haiti has not been left out in the distribution of money from the, from the uh, main um, sectors. The issue about Haiti's numbers of cases 
CARFA does not test for Haiti. Uh, PAHO gave Haiti its own capability for testing. So I'm not aware of their testing protocol or if there were any issues which determine why their cases are the way they are. Um, with a population like that and you're having your own capacity, there are certain assumptions that would be made, but I would not dare to, to go into that space. Now, the, the question that you asked me, I've completely forgotten now. Would you please tell me, my, my, my Caribbean brother? Um, my question was, I mean, the original question was about, do we believe that the number, Haiti with a population of 10 million people? Oh, well, I've answered that. Yeah, you answered that one. So Dr. Marty, I'll come back to you though. We're, we're, the conversation keeps moving. Dr. Marty, uh, you, you've got some different, a different take on that. No, I, it's just very simple. Um, hardly any country has reliable numbers. It's not a matter of them being honest or dishonest. And it's not a matter that they haven't had support. They've had support. But it's a, it's a, uh, it's, Haiti is an impoverished country with a lot of challenges for anyone who, who lives there. I've, I've worked there a number of times and I've uh, also worked at the Dominican Republic. And uh, it's, it's almost invariable that they simply haven't been able to capture whatever the true number is because most countries haven't. So no, you can't believe it any more than you can believe our numbers, which are not accurate either. Um, uh, Dr. Gam Dr. Gamara, I'm gonna uh, bring you into the conversation because uh, you know, you've talked a lot about leadership uh, and governance uh, being uh, heavily impacted um, arising from this crisis. And we actually had a question from the chat, uh, which is really about the um, illicit markets and the illicit economy. And the question is, how will COVID impact security? And illicit markets are also taking a hit, and it could mean a shift to significantly more violent crime. Do you see that as a trend line sort of one of the other unexpected or maybe expected consequences of a global pandemic uh, in the region, the uptick of illicit activities throughout the region? Well, uh, that's a, a difficult question to, uh, to answer without data, okay? Because, uh, I mean, I think we can probably speculate, right, that uh, um, people are afraid. In fact, in the polling that, that I've seen on, uh, on the impact is, you know, when, when you ask people what is their, their main, you know, their main reaction to this, it's fear. People are afraid. People are afraid of, of getting infected and dying. I mean, that's the kind of fear that they have. But we also have a very curious reaction and one in which, you know, we in the United States have also been engaged in. I mean, the, the number of gun sales in this country in the current context is, uh, is frankly embarrassing. Right? Many, many of our compatriots are going out to buy guns because they think that people are going to come into their houses and steal from them. There, ha there are uh, uh, several cases reported throughout the region, not just in the Caribbean, but throughout the region, of things like, uh, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, trucks and stores and so on being, uh, being uh, uh, I, I don't even know what the, how, how you would say it in English, but, you know, they're, they're being raided by, by, by neighbors, you know, who, who are hungry and, and need the food and so on. So that kind of situation is, is uh, we're likely to see more of that, certainly, as, uh, as poverty uh, becomes more extreme and people face situations of hunger and the like. You know, I think that's probably the, the, the case. Uh, but you can also say that this is you know, um, uh, look, the Dominican Republic in particular, again, forget, forgive me for emphasizing this so much in the Dominican Republic, but, you know, the, the number one concern of Dominicans before this crisis was, uh, was insecurity, lack of safety, right? Uh, they're al they already have had a historic problem with, uh, with, uh, with violence. Uh, the Caribbean is a violent place. Right in general, when you look at uh, at uh, UN indicators, when you look at Latin America as a whole, Latin America is the most violent place on earth. Right, the mo most violent deaths uh, occur in in our region. So, is this situation likely to exacerbate that? Uh, probably, but the data is, aren't you know aren't there yet. My my sense, you know, again, is that uh, um, um, uh, one of the things I said earlier. My big concern 
is that the response um, in some measure leads to um, authoritarian responses, right? The reliance on the police and on the military to, uh, to exert social discipline, right? That's a, that's a very, very, you know, uh, thin uh, line that, uh, that the region can cross. Um, and so, you know, so to me, I, I worry not just about the social violence, but I worry now too about the violence that the state can exert in the name of carrying out this, uh, you know, this, uh, this good thing, right, of trying to end COVID. I just wanted to say that one of the things that we have noticed and, and the security clusters looking at it, um, I'm not going to speak about, about gun crime and violence, because as he said, even though I'm in the security cluster, I am not getting those reports as to that overwhelming the, the CARICOM space. But one of the things that has come about, and this is, this is probably because our systems need to be a little bit more robust as we do telework and tele-education, is cybercrime. So what we have noticed in Carfa is that we had more phishing and we even had Zoom bombing because we Zoom or those other platforms um, before Zoom beefed up and before we did our own due diligence, we had Zoom bombing of a, a training that we were doing at the lab technologists in the region. So the cyber crime aspect of it is something that, that we have alerted and the heads of government have actually asked for some, some discussions on, and work on this. But we, we have to look in the same way that we have to change how we do things. We have to look to see how crime is being executed in different ways. So uh, we are uh, actually a few minutes over time. The good news is that this ongoing forum, which has been created by a number of different units at FIU, uh, most notably, our friends at the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Studies Center, uh, the good folks at the Jack D. Gordon uh, Institute, uh, as well as Dr. Espinal and the Global Health Consortium. The list continues. Sometimes I get in trouble when I forget to give shout outs, but lots of good people are working on this ongoing series, which is focused on how we're being responsive in uh, creating a flow of information to our partners and colleagues throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. So far, we're, we're using the name Impacto COVID for this ongoing series, and I want to appreciate everyone who's been involved with getting this off the ground. Dr. Mora, uh, President Solis, uh, Dr. Espinal, uh, Brian Fonseca, uh, and many, many more. So we can double back on some of the conversation topics we've had. Uh, Dr. Marty, Dr. Gamara, Dr. Joy St. John, we are deeply appreciative of your time. I know that Christina and the team behind this conversation are gonna be making all these materials and the PowerPoints that you all shared, uh, we're gonna be making them available as much as possible. So I wanna thank the three of you for joining us for this. And we hope that you're gonna come on back for a future conversation and we can dig into some of these other issues that were raised because we know that now more than ever, information is one mechanism of, of spreading the light and helping to prevent uh, more folks from being impacted in, in countries and others. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.